What's going on guys? Welcome to NetSec Explained. And in this lesson, we're gonna be talking about Java deserialization vulnerabilities, or how to get remote code execution from untrusted data. Now, this lesson we're gonna do a little differently. Instead, we're actually gonna split it up into three separate lessons, where this first one, we're gonna be talking about serialized data, understanding it, and why deserialization is so powerful. In the next video, we're gonna be talking about how to find potential deserialization vulnerabilities from both a black box and a white box perspective. And then in this last video, we're gonna show you how to actually exploit Java deserialization vulnerabilities. So let's go ahead, get started, and jump right in. The first thing we want to understand is what is serialized data and why do we need it? Well, if you have two applications that need to talk to each other, then you need to transmit what's in application A's memory into application B in a way that application B can understand it. So a very common form of serialization that you should already be familiar with is JSON. JSON is considered a data only type of serialization which means that it's fairly secure. So JSON only allows certain data types to be transmitted. We see here we have the string, John Doe, the integer, 28, and a Boolean, which is a true false value. We can also have a list of objects, or we can have an object of objects. So we can store JSON data within JSON data, like we see here with details. Another form of serialization that you should already be familiar with is XML. As you can see here, XML is able to transmit the same kind of information as JSON, but there's a few more extra features that it allows us to do. So if you've ever heard of XXE or XML external entities, this is what I'm talking about. So in XML, what we can do is create a custom doc type and an entity such as my var, where we tell the system to read the local file Etsy password, and then we replace our name with the my var variable. What this will allow us to do is read the file Etsy password, and that will be passed to us where the name would normally be in the receiving application. This is why XXE is considered one of the OWASP top 10 and very powerful. This is possible because in XML, the doc type and the entity are being evaluated while the object is being deserialized. So what we need to do is create an object that will be evaluated on load. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about what the serialization and deserialization process looks like. So typically you have a sender and a receiver. So in this case, we have a writer and a reader and I'll break them down piece by piece. We're gonna create an object in memory. So in this example, we're just going to use Python and the pickle library as our serialization method. So here we have the my data object where we have a name, a date, and an age. So all of this is stored in memory, but we need to turn this into something that a receiving Python application will understand. So here's where we serialize the data. We're gonna use the pickle.dumps function in order to turn it into bytes. And then we're just gonna go ahead and write those bytes to a file. The read serial object is gonna be the exact same thing except in reverse. So the first thing we're gonna do is read the file. So now we have a group of bytes and then we're gonna use the pickle.loads function to turn that back into a memory object. And once we do that, we can interact with the object as though the receiving application created that object in the first place. Okay, that's all well and good, but how do we exploit something like this? It looks like the pickle read file is just reading what's written to disk and then adding it to memory. Where's the exploit come in? Well, that's actually a really good question. What we need to do is find a way that the object will execute on load. To do this, there are very language specific ways that we do it, but the overarching idea is that we have something in the receiving application that is able to run code. These are called gadgets, and we call them on that load. So for XML, that would be our XML external entities. For Python, we're gonna be using the reduce method 
in a custom class that we create. When we create a backdoor in Python, what we're gonna do is create our own class. We're gonna use the reduce method, and then we're gonna serialize that data so that when another object or another application loads that object, it'll execute. Here's what this looks like. First, we're gonna start off with our importing pickle and creating our custom class RCE, and we're gonna use the reduce method. Then we're gonna enter in our command that we want the receiving application to run on the system. So in this case, what we're gonna do is use os.system, and we're gonna have a pretty typical bash backdoor using netcat and a file input output kind of operator. Then, just like before, we're gonna serialize the data with our pickles.dumps, and we're gonna write it to file. Now, we have our backdoored object. If we went ahead and loaded it into the receiving application, it'll run our code and give us a backdoor. Now, I use Python here because I think it's easier to understand this class of vulnerabilities. With Java, it gets significantly more complicated. So for example, here we have our os.system. We can load that into the receiving application just because of the way that Python libraries operate. In Java, it's gonna be significantly more difficult because we have to make certain assumptions about the types of libraries that are loaded into the receiving application. Now, there's only a handful of these gadgets for Java that'll actually execute code on load. And so we'll see that once we get more into the actual exploitation of Java deserialization, but we're gonna be using a tool called Why So Serial where researchers have already identified all of the potential uh, Java code execution gadgets. And so you just run down the list and see what actually runs. To recap, what does our deserialization attack chain look like? Well, first, we need to identify a vulnerable read function. A vulnerable read function is any sort of deserialization method that takes untrusted user data without any sort of sanitization. Then we're gonna go ahead and locate an available gadget, what will allow us to execute code on load and then we're gonna craft our exploit payload and we're gonna submit that payload to the target application. And as we continue with these videos, we're gonna see how to do this step by step. As I mentioned earlier in this video, the next video, we're gonna be talking about how to identify vulnerable read functions or candidate points from a black box and a white box perspective. And then in the last video, we're gonna cover the last three points by actually exploiting Java deserialization vulnerabilities. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. For more information, check out the links in the description below. And don't forget to like and subscribe to see more videos like this. I'll see you next time.